Today our sermon title is Jesus' Chosen Family. And I need to acknowledge that chosen family as a phrase and as a concept has been gifted to the world by the LGBTQ community. You probably know that, but I want to just make sure I say that right from the outset. It actually was, I believe, from what I can tell, coined in 1991 in a book called Families We Choose, Lesbians, Gays, and Kinship by Kath Watson. I haven't read the book, so I, but it sounds good. Uh, but that's where this comes from. And it's, it comes from the LGBT community because of the prevalence of harmful relationships in biological families, right? Um, harmful and rejecting relationships. The Trevor Project uh, did a survey in 2022, so not too long ago, that found that fewer than one in three trans and non-binary youth found their home to be gender affirming. Fewer than one in three. And only about 37% of LGBTQIA plus youth feel like their home is an affirming space, right? So no wonder, we need a chosen family. Chosen family is a way to create new systems of support where the systems that should support are failing. Systems to support mental health, systems to help with mutual aid, systems that provide companionship and safety. And so chosen family is this non-biological kinship that is chosen for the purpose of mutual support and love. That's one of the many definitions that I found that I really liked. And naming that concept uh, and modeling that concept is a gift to the world that the queer community gives. Like, thank you, it's a gift to the world. Because this is something that's important for all of us, regardless of our identity, right? Anyone who doesn't feel completely understood or accepted by your biological or adoptive family, whether that's because of mental health issues or neurodiversity or deep religious differences or political differences, whether that's because of abuse you've experienced in your biological family or rejection. There are tons of reasons, right? that we all need a chosen family. And these can sometimes be a substitute for family systems that are harmful, and sometimes it's a supplement, right? We can add to our family, as Anna was talking about, adding to our family with different, in different ways. But it's a unique combination of relationships that sustain us, that are important to us. And even though it was coined in 1991, I really think the concept goes back much further, don't you? The concept is wildly important in our own history as Christians, and I think probably for people of other faith as well. But Christianity was built on these non-biological kinship bonds that we hear about, chosen for the purpose of mutual support and love. What did the early Christians call each other? Shout it out. Brother and sister, sibling, yes, that's a chosen family. What do some branches of our faith call their religious leaders? Father and mother, yes, father and mother. It's relying on this familial concept. What is our central ritual? Where was it hosted before we had big grand buildings? At a home, around a table, yes, our religion is one of non-biological kinship bonds. More uh, easier to say, chosen family, right? This goes back way deep into our roots. Jesus had a complicated relationship with his family when we start looking at his story. He baffles his parents, right? Whether he's being the subject of, uh, or the object of strange blessings when he's taken to the temple as a baby, or whether he gets lost and left behind at the temple as a young preteen. We have Mary, who we mentioned earlier, who does get a glimpse of how different 
Jesus' life may turn out to be. And in the beginning, we see her with remarkable support and courage for uh, the direction of his life. But then if we keep reading the story, it seems like maybe the reality of just how different he was sets in, just how dangerous this might be for him, right? That's scary for a parent. And she tries to shut him down. We have the story about her gathering Jesus' other brothers to go take him away, take him back home from this wild teachings that he's doing, this wild community that he's leading. And does anyone remember what Jesus says to her? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers but those who follow me? Right. So it's almost like he's saying these bonds with this chosen family are more important than those biological ties, even. Joseph, we don't know where he's at. He's nowhere to be found after the beginning of the story. Maybe he died, or maybe he uh, was not supportive of Jesus' mission. We don't know, but he is kind of erased, at least in our the narrative that we have in our scripture. Mary, while her journey might be a little bit of a roller coaster, at least she's there, right? So that's good. We can stick with people because in the end, she does come back around, right? She was in our scripture today, there, one of the last people with Jesus as he is on the cross. As her worst fears come true, she's there supporting him. And in that moment, Jesus looks at her and looks at his beloved disciple and solidifies his chosen family, right? Here is your son. Here is your mother. And immediately, the disciple takes Mary into his house. This chosen family is not just for personal survival, though it is for that, right? But it's also for a community that can grow, that can enfold others. And Jesus models that up to his very last breath. This support that enfolds us in mutual support and love. But Jesus' chosen family didn't start there at the cross in that very obvious moment, did it? He's been building it throughout his life and throughout his ministry. Those of you who are in the queer community give us such great models of the kind of community that Jesus was building then and continues to build now in our world. And yet, that same community that has so much in common with Jesus and those earliest followers is so often pushed to the side. You know how that happens. Rejected, erased by churches, by biblical interpreters, by religious leaders. And first of all, I just want to say I'm so sorry. We don't do that here. We try not to. We mess it up, and then we do better. I know that we can't, uh, we can't know the inner lives of people from 2,000 years ago. We've said this every week in this Pride Month. We can't out anyone. We don't know gender identities or sexual orientations of biblical characters, and they didn't even have the same categories to work with that we have to work with now. But it's interesting to me that we only ever make that caveat when we're talking about these characters as queer, or possibly queer, right? We imagine these characters as uh, hetero, cis characters all the time, right? But we don't say, well, we can't actually know what they felt or who they were. We just assume. So I think today what we want to do is exercise our holy imaginations, recognizing that we can't know Practice imagining, because cishet people like me do this all the time, so you all get to do it too. It's only fair. Last week, Lily preached, and she challenged us to go through the week flipping our assumptions of everyone we met. She challenged us to assume that everyone is queer unless we were told otherwise. Did anybody try it? Anybody? Yeah, okay, good. Some interesting uh, brain uh, transformations happening, I hope. If you didn't try it, it's not too late. You can try it now. But in honor of Pride Month and in honor of all of you who model for the world what chosen family looks like, I want us to do the same thing with our scripture today. You have permission, not that you need it from me, but you have permission to flip your assumptions and to find yourself 
to find your neighbor in scripture, where maybe you haven't before, but to find yourself just as you are, okay? When we look at Jesus' life and his chosen family through a queer perspective, assuming that everyone is somewhere in the LGBTQIA plus spectrum, what do we see? I'm not even going to do the hard work. I'm just going to tell you the facts. And you guys use your holy imaginations to see these in a different light, okay? So let's start with Jesus, right? Jesus is a man who chooses not to marry, very countercultural decision for him. He chooses not to have a family. He travels around with a group of male admirers, one of whom is his favorite. He's nicknamed the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. We met him today in our text, but that's not the only time he shows up. We found him before that in the Lord's Supper in John 13. The beloved disciple is reclining in Jesus' bosom, is what the phrase says. He's laying on his chest. This is the most intimate position that you can think of in uh, the Greco-Roman world, where they are so close at the Lord's Supper that they can whisper together, Jesus and the beloved disciple, about the others. Do a little gossip session, right? Peter has the beloved disciple ask Jesus who's going to betray him, and so they have this little side conversation, the one that dips it in the bread. You remember, right? The beloved disciple is laying in his bosom. Later, after Jesus has uh, died, and then the, the disciples hear about the empty tomb that the women have found, the beloved disciple, along with Peter, are the first ones to take off running. He's the first one there. He's the first one also to recognize Jesus at one of his post-resurrection appearances when Jesus comes walking along the beach. Uh, after all has been said and done, he sees him and knows him. Look, it's the Lord, the beloved disciple says, John 21. He follows Peter and Jesus while they are having a conversation. The beloved disciple tags along. And in this little tagging along scene, we're reminded again that this one who's tagging along was the one that Jesus loved, who laid on his bosom at the, at the supper. Now, if you're looking at your NRSV, it probably just says that he reclined with him. That's not what the Greek says. It literally says he laid on his bosom or on his breast. But man, we can't put that in our scripture because what will people think? What will their imaginations do, right? This one who has laid on Jesus' bosom, we've been told about it twice, who is the secret keeper, who is the tag along, he's the one who says at the very end of John, this is the one who wrote the gospel. Now, we don't know if John actually wrote the gospel of John. I know that that's very confusing. But maybe the beloved disciple is John, and he wrote the gospel of John. There are some other arguments, too. We won't go into all of that. But this person, the disciple who Jesus loved, is the one who tells Jesus' story. Right? Who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Anybody else getting Eliza Hamilton? Yeah, vibes. Good. Whatever you're imagining now, with just the facts that I've laid out, regardless, we know that this is a relationship that is different than conventional norms, right? It's strange. It's queer. And it's not the only relationship like that in the New Testament, right? When we look at the other people that are surrounding Jesus, Jesus' chosen family, we find women who are funding the revolution, right? Women who maybe they've left their husbands, maybe they're widows, but they're finally able to step into positions of agency, who are disciples along with the men. We come across characters like Mary and Martha, who are sisters, right? Or sisters, or roommates, perhaps? These stories are all written much later than they happened by people in the church who called each other sister and brother. So what is their relationship like? They're definitely bending gender expectations regardless, right? Martha is the head of the household, even though her brother brother, Lazarus, lives there too. Mary is sitting with the male disciples to learn. 
all kinds of strangeness and queerness happening in that family. But we keep pressing forward into Acts, the beginnings of the fledgling church. One of the very first converts, one of the very first missionaries, is the Ethiopian eunuch. Right, eunuch was kind of a catch-all term for uh, men who were um, either slaves who were castrated, or intersex people, or uh, men that were just not interested in getting married for whatever reason you can imagine. These were safe people to be uh, leaders in Egypt, or sorry, in Ethiopia, and other places as well. And so this was uh, a sign of honor in some cultures and, and a kind of way to promote yourselves uh, in the general, um, in your kind of economic standing. And this Ethiopian eunuch, we don't know what kind of a eunuch he is. He comes to the temple and is probably rejected there because of Jewish laws and customs that wouldn't allow him into the inner sanctums. But on his way out, he finds his belonging in those same stories in the Jewish scripture through Jesus who fulfills it, through Philip who sees him and says, what can prevent me from baptizing this one? This is one of our earliest faith heroes. We get pushed even further to Paul, the Apostle Paul. I know we all hate Paul here, right? No, don't hate Paul. I swear he's a good guy. <laughs> Part of my mission in life is to, like, redeem Paul. But I think there's some really interesting things about Paul. Um, even if you see the worst in him, the self-judging, right? Being tormented always by a thorn in the flesh— being negative about his own body, being at war between what his mind and body wants. You guys remember these kind of, maybe not because you probably don't read Paul that much, but he's a tortured person. He refuses also to seek marriage as an outlet for, for his passions. And there are many other examples of data points that John Shelby Spong says, uh, well, what he says is nothing else accounts for this data as well as the possibility that Paul was a rigidly controlled gay male. Again, we don't know, but if you can see Paul with that imagination, does that give you some more compassion for him? Can we see maybe where he's coming from in his culture a little bit better? He talks about uh, God, and he talks about his role as a pastor with feminine metaphors. I am in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, he says in Galatians 4. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you, he says in 1 Thessalonians. He doesn't marry uh, that we know of, but he's always traveling with a partner, right? In his conversion experience, he realizes that God loved him as he was. Jesus appears to Paul as he was. And Paul can continue to struggle to accept himself and also say with confidence, as Jody read earlier, that nothing can separate him, nothing can separate us, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not height, not depth, not angels, not rulers, not things present or things to come. What if Paul's letters are a view into his own internal struggle and the ways that God is showing him that he loves him just as he is. Spong, who I quoted earlier, says that it's a beautiful idea that a gay man living with both self-judgments and societal judgments could not in spite of this, but because of this, be the one who would define grace for Christian people. Be the one who would show us what conditional love is. We could go on. We could go on in other biblical stories, we could go on in the lives of Christian saints from the early centuries until now. <coughs> it's like Lily's Subaru illustration last week, where once you start looking for it, you see them everywhere. Right? It's the same thing. If you start looking for queer folks or possibly queer folks in scripture and in church history, you're going to see them everywhere. Thanks be to God. There are so many examples of relationships that go against the societal norms of gender, of sexuality, of race, of religion even. There are so many examples of a love that is strange, that is queer, that is beautiful. Examples of chosen family, 
thriving and struggling and persisting. Yes, there are many things that we can't actually know. So we're just using our imaginations here. There's so much we can't know and we wish that we could. There's so much that we think we know that are really just our own assumptions and our own bias that is based on a dominant culture's assumptions and biases. So doing these exercises in holy imagination help balance that out, help trouble those assumptions. This is what we mean by querying scripture, helping trouble our assumptions, not making an argument for what we know is true, but troubling the assumptions that we know are false. Querying scripture gives us new insight into these stories, new insight into the heroes of our faith. It helps us all connect to them, to see ourselves in them, to see our neighbors in them. Querying scripture helps all of us, regardless of our identity, to receive the good news, the gospel, that God loves you just as you are in all your strangeness, in all your quirks, in all your self-judgments, in all your closets, in all your pride, if Jesus' chosen family can look like that, then you can be chosen to be in Jesus' family too. You fit right in, <laughs> just as you are. We see the beloved queerness of Jesus' chosen family all through scripture, and we see it all through this family too, and I'm so proud of that. On Sundays, we see it in the queer faith stories that have been shared. We see it in all kinds of families worshiping together. We see it in members bringing others who can't drive, being that connection point to them. On Thursdays, we see it around tables at a truly holy meal, God's family dinner, where a guest might call me father, where another uh, might celebrate finding housing, where another might receive prayer from Pastor Robin, where another might ask the group for prayers of peace. We see it on Wednesdays now, too with a queer Muslim chef feeding students and community members, who many of whom were arrested recently for peacefully protesting. And thank God, by the way, most of those arrests uh, were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The charges were dropped. Yes, thank you. So there are a few that are left, so keep praying for those kids. We see it in those students and the compassion and courage that they have. We see it in all the volunteers coming together. We see it in the church ladies at the doors back there opening up and letting people in. When I look at scripture and when I look around here, I think, yeah, okay, this makes sense. We're doing something right, right? And I hope you feel that too these days. We're doing it imperfectly. But fundamentally, what is happening here is good, and it's right in line with our faith ancestors. And I'm so proud to be a part of this chosen family. There are so many other stories to be told. Um, and if anyone else has a queer faith story that you would like to tell, we've got Austin Pride coming around in August. Let me know, and I would love to, to get you uh, in on the mix for that. But whether it's Pride Week or Pride Month or not, I just want to say thanks be to God for all of our queer siblings, those of you we know and those of you we don't know yet, all those who are in our faith history, in our scripture, in our community now, who help our whole community see ourselves and each other as queerfully and wonderfully made, just as we are. Thanks be to God. Amen.